All right, so we have to officially start the class and acknowledge uh, that it is Tobias's birthday. Anybody want to second that motion? <laughs> All in favor of wishing me a happy birthday, say aye. 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 You've been wished happy birthday. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about uh, installation. Um, well, this is actually a bit of a review, so I think I can go really fast through this. There are, tell me if it's not, three types of crankshafts. There is regular. Okay, we'll go tapered because regular is not one I have on here. <laughs> Taper, we have splined. splined, and we have flanged, flanged. So we covered this in engines, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, so we don't have to spend a whole lot of time on this, just a simple reminder that we have the three different types. Flanged. What is this sh uh, depicting here in the picture? Uh, mm. Starter ring gear, yeah. support, yeah. plus yeah. ring gear. And, uh, all right, so let's go with this. So we've talked a lot about this, and you should be very familiar with this. The first thing that I think we should note here, um, whether or not it's on my notes or not, we're just going to cover it anyway. Let's see here. Yes, there is my representation of a propeller. My daughter said today that she has, do you guys know Katie, right? Yeah. She said today that she was taking, she's finishing up one of her, her psychology class and she was going to, the next one was like introduction to drawing. She's a really good artist. I said, well, I should take that class. She goes, I don't know, Dad. I've seen your drawings. They're pretty spot on. <laughs> Get out of the car. <laughs> okay. As most of you have already figured out, when you put a propeller on, you put the engine on top dead center of number one cylinder, mm -hmm. and the propeller is not horizontal, horizontal or straight up and down. Yeah. It goes in that fashion right there. So there's different ways that the manufacturer may tell you to do this. Some of them are rather confusing. You're like, what? But you kind of work it through and you're like, okay, that's what you wanted. In short, the easiest one is put the engine on top dead center of number one, put the propeller on perfectly horizontal, then take it off and move it one bolt hole in the direction of rotation. And it should stop just like that. That is top dead center. And the reason why that is top dead center is probably, because I've never, you know, nobody's ever said this is for sure, but that's the only place where you can hand prop an engine. Um, if, the, if it's an appropriate engine. All right, so before I started, to, my water bottle, I'll just keep talking. Before I was teaching here, you guys overhauled A65s. A65 Continental doesn't have a starter. So guess how you started these things? Hand prop them. Hand prop them. There's nothing like watching a student about get his neck chopped off every time. <laughs> and so the stand that we used was yay tall. The crankshaft is about right here. And it was perfectly horizontal. So you would kind of start like that. Oh, nice. Oh, not good. All right. Even a 150 is taller than that, which has a starter. But you look at the Taylor craft, I'm so happy it's here, or even the, um, the uh, what's, uh, it's not a mall, is it a mall? No, um, what's in front of that? Husky. Husky, thank you, the Husky. I mean, look how that propeller tip is, you know, the hub is about yay high on me, mm. right? That's, that's a, maybe even taller, that's a pretty tall. Mine is about right here. Yeah, exactly right there, I'm a 182. I'm not hand propping a six cylinder. Um, <clears throat> because that does not work for a six cylinder. I mean, it's one of them, but then it's going to be different in another cylinder, and then it's back to this. It's, it does go back and forth on a six-cylinder. Uh, but anyway, the Taylor Craft does have an A65. You do hand prop that, but look how it's set up. It's the tail dragger. It comes up. 
The hub is about right here on that thing, so it's really tall, right? And so it makes sense the way it rotates around to have it in that position. Now you would think that's top dead center, but that's where the most, you would think you'd want the compression right about here, right? <coughs> but that doesn't work because then it starts here. It starts to get compression in here. So you're trying to get over here. So if, it, if you do it, it makes perfect sense on, <coughs> sorry, I don't know what the heck, <coughs> on an airplane that is set up correctly. So probably the reason why they're that way started with because you had to hand prop it that way. And then from there, it just became the standard, and that's the way they're set up. I don't necessarily think that it would be horrific. I don't know if you got it wrong. I, I wouldn't want to, but um, there are some engines where it is. So in other words, if you, you read the manual, and it's going to be an airframe issue, and they tell you, hey, this is how drop on. Um, if you're working on like a GO 300, I know that the way you index the, the, uh, the GO is geared, the way you uh, put the gear reduction unit on, it says right in there, if you miss it off by a tooth, it'll probably self-destruct the engine. And it's very much pinned. I think this is the GO right there. You have an indexing pin. When it really, really matters, they put index pins. Like, it has to go this way. Uh, believe it or not, these also have indexes in it. Look at around that and you can see that not everything is the same. Okay. I believe that this is going to fit quite well in my example. By the way, this is a constant speed because the middle is taken out. <clears throat> but these pins, there's one that's different than the rest. They should all be sticking out. And so one of these pins is generally speaking a little bit smaller than the rest of them. So the backside's all the same where it goes into the hub, but then when, it, then when it sticks out, this is a little bit smaller. And if you look on the back of the propeller, guess what? One of those holes is just a little bit smaller. But if you don't put it on correctly, and let's just say that little bit smaller hole was supposed to go here or somewhere here, but it didn't, I don't wanna do this. Yeah, this is a little bit smaller one. So um, if you get that little bit smaller one off and you put the prop on, torque it down, you actually push out a bushing. And that's exactly what happened. They pushed it out because um, the hole it was supposed to go into was on the prop was too small. Too small. So they, had, they put the small one here and the small one probably should have went here or here or here or here. I can't tell by looking at it, but one of these was the small. And also um, the starter ring gear does too. It often has a little mark on it, <laughs> usually a little O somewhere on it where it's indexed. So you have to look for the indexing on these things. Um, the master spline is the index here. That is actually raised up. So it's like they forgot to groove it in. And so if you, now sometimes they'll do that. Sometimes they'll just take and put a screw right there, a pin or something. That's called the master spline. And then when you look at the prop hub, you're going to see a spot where it's been grooved out too. Like they shaved off one of the grooves. Like, well, you're missing an entire groove. It's shaved off. And that goes over the master spline so that it's always properly indexed. And of course, the taper has the big keyway on it that you can't, I mean, you can. <laughs> you can. You can mess that up. So we have those. So I see temple uh, bushing. So yeah, look for the master bushing. Make sure you get it on correctly. I showed you that. <clears throat> we talked about this last uh, class about the prop hub. Oops about the prop hub, how that goes on, and you guys are now experiencing this, at least with the ground adjustable, you're just using a much larger version of this, where it's also the presses it on and it pulls it off. Everybody go clear on that one? Okay. Um, let's see. You have to write your own notes now. <clears throat> ah. I may not have mentioned this ever before, but the wrench size is not <laughs> the bolt size. Yes, because I had a student who was, I told you this, getting ready to graduate, putting the prop on the, the Cherokee out there. And Kevin, man, it's just because you, it goes, you have the, the starter ring gear, then the prop, then you have an aluminum dish that goes on that holds, it's a spinner bulkhead. It's just aluminum. And 
and you know the student came to me and said, I just can't, you know, it's really distorting that. And I'm like, what? I come out there, I'm like, what are you torquing it to? Like a thousand inch pounds. I'm like, what? Why? I'm like, well, because it's a three. Oh. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, I did just destroy this bulkhead. And those bulkheads are, they could be thousands of dollars. No. And when you safety, I have safety here. I'll just throw this in here. Safety wire. Safety wire. The general convention is that you're going to use 040, 041 whenever you do props. I believe there is an ex exception to one of the Hartzell props, but that's, you'll get that some other day. Um, but for the most part, it's always considered that you're using 04, uh, 041. And I say that because they do make 040 and they do make 041. And if you get down to the nitty gritty, where does this come from? It's not in 4313 or anything. It actually comes from the, from the manuals. So um, sense niche says you should use 0.040. And Macaulay, Macaulay says 041. So guess which one I have in my toolbox? 041. Now work for both, right? Yep. Because you're using at least 040. All right. uh, so just remember that. I think I have to give you a little bit more information on some of this stuff. All right, safety wire, the taper crank. The hub adapter, remember how you put that on? Don't put your finger inside, why? Prussian blue, so you're gonna put Prussian blue on it, you're gonna put it on, torque it, take it off, and you have the transfer of the blue from either the hub to the shaft or from the shaft to the hub. And you have to have how much? Wow, 70%. So minimum 70% contact area. <clears throat> also put it on with anti-seize an appropriate amount. And I say take them off every year or so. Oops. Spline shaft, let me see, on the master spline. Um, how do you know if your splines are good or not? Go slash no go. All right, that's an official statement. I've never seen it go, no go gauge for the splines for wear. I've never done one. <clears throat> I don't know what the data is. No. I've used one on the C47. Have you? Yeah, there's a shaft on the uh, combining transmission. On the what? Uh, combining transmission. For what? What airplane? For the CH47. Okay, cool. Well, that would make sense on those for yeah, sure. It's just, it's just like, mm -hmm. a, like a little spline, like socket. If yeah. it goes in, it's bad. If it doesn't go in, it's good. Cool. Just testing like how much it's worn. Yeah, I bet that thing costs a lot of money. It looks pretty good. Though. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So there you go. Same thing. I just don't see it done on crankshafts. You know, when we're out in the field putting props on. And these crankshafts are old. I mean, you're World War II vintage stuff. I don't know what would happen if... Mechanical. Hey, I used to go no gig age like I'm supposed to, and you need a new crankshaft. <laughs> Probably just come and get their airplane. I'll take it. Someone doesn't know. But you know, good is good, bad is bad. Uh, let me see. Oh, cones. Cones can be a little confusing for some people. I've noticed. I don't know why. Okay. There are a fair amount of Q&A questions, I think, about the cones that you use. And I'll try and make, do the best I can with this photo here because it's all I've got to work with. So if we take a look at what we've got going on, this is the hub. The hub is part of what? The crankshaft. Nope. Uh, the, the prop. All right, so this is the prop. This is all the prop, right? Okay. 
and we have down here and yeah, this is all the prop shaft actually I should do this a little more red because that's all so this is all it's all the hub right but it's just been cut away you can't see the rest of it it goes forward more everything's <clears throat> you have a thrust nut on this type of engine and so that means usually up in the front instead of having plain bearings you have a, a big roller bearing and this thrust nut is tightened very tight against that bearing and it holds it in place Huh? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the nut's going to go around with the engine, and so you have these cones. Get the cone in here. Used to have a spline shaft in there, but I couldn't. Should have brought it in. I got all you monsters going to the gym all the time. So here's a cone. Cool. All right. So the cone is going to go on the shaft. I'd like to see you put this on your arm. <laughs> uh, goes over the shaft. And the hub is going to come, and that helps center the hub. All right. And you're going to have one on the front. And so it's going to go on the front, and then you're going to tighten the shaft on there. So that fits it in. Well, there becomes this problem that sometimes it doesn't fit very well. And if we take a look at what they're trying to show us right here, notice how you have all of this space right here. See that? And it's only touching right here. So it's not touching the cone per se, but it's touching the edge of the cone. Why? Why? because it's not sitting right. So you have a problem. So if I tighten up the prop on this thing and this little spot wears, what happens? Yeah, Propeller's gonna start wobbling on there because it's not sitting well. You're, you're not, all of this contact area is being missed. So it's just hit this pinch point. So what's the solution to that? How would you fix this? Hey, take it off and try it again all damn day. This thing is pretty long, and this it's going to hit right there. 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 I can go all day. How many times do you want to? Would you replace the cone? Oh, yeah. Let's, let's go with, okay, thank you. So let's go with the uh, Flight of the Phoenix scenario. You can't just go to the store and buy a new one. How do you fix this here? File down the hub a little bit. If you file down the hub and, and bring this back a little bit, then this now, the hub will now sit on the cone. Okay? So your question center, um, installation uses front and rear cones. Let me see. <clears throat> rear cone bottoming is common and must be corrected. Front cone bottoming may happen if cone hits splines. Okay. So this is what's going to happen on the back. Now on the front, you can have a little bit of the, a different problem in that What it's depicting here is that this right here is all space. Nothing's being, that, that is air right there. Okay? Follow? Okay. So you put the rear cone on. You brought the front cone on. This represents right here how it goes in the hub nut and stuff. So you tighten that up and tightens up real nice. But now this time you should be able to feel the prop kind of move a little bit because the cone hit the spline and left a space. So the prop has movement back and forth. So that is front cone bottoming versus rear cone. You follow? Mm -hmm. These are real things you got to watch for. Don't hurt yourself, Oscar. So what are we going to do on this one? Grind a little bit of the shaft away? Yeah, that's <laughs> Yeah. Eh, if you brought the shaft, it would. I wouldn't be grinding on the crankshaft. A little bit of that. Cone. Cone. You gotta, you're always going to correct the cones. Yep. Um, okay. Let me see. 
You don't actually grind the front cone, though. You need to move the hub forward. So how can we move the hub forward? So you can keep tightening it all you want. This cone is up against the crankshaft. You got to move the hub forward. Well, we can go back to the other side. Put some shims back here. Because this now is corrected. So this cone is hitting the hub properly. And we put a shim back here. It will move the whole hub forward. Now, shims aren't going to help you here because it's hitting right there. Follow? Okay. Some of you are like, I have no idea. I don't give a crap. How many test questions am I going to miss if I don't know? Am I right? Yep. <laughs> Good attitude. Can't wait to see you guys out in the field. <laughs> All right, cones. Let me see. Cones, cones, cones. Um, so, again. Use Prussian blue. To verify 70% contact. Um, rear cone bottoming. Oops, sorry. Rear cone bottoming is common and must be corrected. Now, if it's a, probably if it's an airplane that hasn't had a recent overhaul and the prop's been on for a long time, you take it off and put it back on, it's usually not a problem. It's not like it's suddenly, suddenly is a problem. It's when you're putting new cones, new props, that kind of thing. Um, front cone, bottoming may happen. If cone hits splines before hub. That says must be what? Corrected. 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 Before it hits hub. If this happens. Move rear cone forward. Check tracking after install. Every single time you put a prop back on an aircraft, you should check tracking. It's not that the prop got bent. It's just one of the, one nice way to see if you screwed up. You know, did you accidentally get it on a little bit crooked? That That's happened. Uh, mechanics get the prop on crooked, tighten it up. It just gall, it just starts pulling metal, but it really, all the bolts tighten up real nice. And the whole thing is crooked. If you check tracking, you'd catch that before you sent out the door and it, worked its way free and then loose and then came off. I had a student uh, many years ago who told the story. We were right about here and, and I don't know. And he told the story of losing a prop in flight. Did I tell you guys that story? Uh, Ruben, if you guys ever get a chance to meet Ruben, real interesting guy. He was a sheriff. Um, actually ended up flying helicopters for the sheriff, sheriff's department in town. Real smart guy. Um, so he had, I think it was like a 206 high wing Cessna type plane. And he had bought it from somebody, and I don't know how long he had owned it, but um, he was up flying in the mountains with a plane load of people, and he started getting oil on the windscreen. And it started getting real bad. And so he said, I mean, I gotta start finding, a, you know, looking for a place to land this thing. And before you know it, the whole windscreen is just oil, covered in oil. He can see nothing. But before it, he kind of looked out the window and he saw a spot. That's my only spot. I'm gonna pick that. So he comes around and he is completely blind. He can't see anything. He's just kind of guessing now sort of where that spot is. And as he gets near that spot, you can see the trees just kind of go up. He knows he's in the spot. And he gets this plane down on the ground. 
And he talks about getting out. And he said, he's just he's shaking. He's terrified. He can't believe that he survived this, that he even managed to get it on the ground. I mean, you know, this is, this is an absolute miracle. And he said, he's just standing there, just, you know, trying not to vomit and, and whatnot. And then, you know, the guy gets out of the plane and he's like, what happened to your prop? He turns around, there is no prop on the plane. There is no shaft on the plane. It broke clean off behind the prop shaft. And they never found the propeller, it just left. And it pumped all the oil out and up on the engine, and up on the windscreen, and, and yeah. He, uh, somebody asked him if he went looking for the guy who sold him the plane, and he said, yeah, he, he said there was a prop strike, and they didn't do a prop strike inspection. They tried to cover it up. He, then he was quiet about what happened after that. I don't know <laughs> if he took care of business or whatnot. I don't know. Um, but anyway, yeah, check tracking after install. Um, so we talked about tracking, right? That's where one blade comes around. You want to make sure it's in the exact same plane. And you guys are going to practice that out there. So let me see. Max allowable. So max allowable. This information isn't always easy to find. Um, I don't even remember exactly where. I think it comes out of 4313 is where you're going to find it. Out of track, it is um, one sixteenth, one sixteenth for metal. Well, metal's a little stiffer; it doesn't crush on the hub. Uh, when you work with these wood props, you do get crush on the wood. It's which you won't see on an aluminum prop, of course. You know, it's the hub is nice and smooth, and it's always going to be. If you have crush on aluminum, call me. I want to see this. Uh, but you will just over time and torquing, it crushes the wood. And so you have an indent on the wood. So if you're getting indents on your wood, you got to figure, well, let's do twice the allowable. So what's twice the allowable? It's 32nd, right? Yeah. <laughs> Eighth inch for wood. This is an inch, right? Yes. Millimeters. Why are you making trouble back there? And if, if you have a wood, no, I think it's for both. You can add shims, believe it or not, to bring tracking in. You have to follow the manufacturer instructions. I've worked on some wood aircraft or uh, wood props that did have some shims in there. I'm not crazy about that. I'd prefer, if I, if I were doing an annual and I pulled it off, there were shims, I would send it off to the prop shop and have them back to Sensenich and they would plane it straight or I'll look at it. Um, that's a good question. No, because they have metal hubs usually. Yeah, I think they'll have metal hubs. Oh. I even have this in my notes. So tracking can be corrected with shims. So as a mechanic out there, you may be called upon to deal with an aircraft that has a lot of vibration. So, well, yeah, I had, boy, that's how I ended up working at uh, JetX over the summer. It all started with a 182 with a significant vibration issue. And uh, I told you that, with it, I had to get in there and change out the counterweights and all that stuff. And I got all done with it and I took it outside and I ran it. I'm like, damn, this thing runs like crap. You know, at this point, I know what a 182 should feel like, you know, and I'm like, and I called the, you know, uh, Nathan got in the plane. He goes, no, no, this is like twice as good as it used to be. I'm like, wow, this is really bad now. And so, you know, I called the owner and I'm like, man, this thing really shakes. And he, he oh, well, so he took it for a test flight. He goes, no, it's actually a lot better than it used to be. I'm like, okay. He Something's goes, wrong. he goes, I don't know the difference, Kevin. You know, this is the plane I've always, I'm like, man, it's bad. It is real bad. So I said, well, we need to get a static. Uh, I mean, a, a, a dynamic balance done is where, and you guys are going to do this um, next, uh, in second year, you put a um, machine on it and it's going to measure your, um, your ips, inches per second shake, and you, it indexes a blade and it tells you where to put the weights and stuff. And so they called a guy out to do that and he put it on there and he says, the maximum weight I can put on there will not correct this problem. It is so far out. So 
you know, at that point, you know, they keep asking me, what are you going to do? I'm like, well, you need to take the prop off and you need to send it in, right? And so they did in the prop shop. It, it was, we'll talk about, but it was a Macaulay um, threaded prop. They, you don't really even work on those anymore. They, they need, they're just not worth working on. So um, he ended up buying a new one, which uh, solved that problem. But yeah, that prop was just so far out of balance. It was just horrific. So um, a lot of, so I guess I tell you that story to tell you that a lot of aircraft have had dynamic balancing done. And when that happens, you are balancing the prop to the engine in a very specific way with every part specifically installed. Because, you know, a prop can go on this way or it can go on this way. You know, it's not usually indexed. The number one blade goes here and the two here on top dead center. People don't write that down. You just put it on. It goes this way or that way. It's, you know, you don't know. And the same with the spinner. They're symmetrical. You go this way or turn it 180 and go back on. So it's really important when you take a part an engine, uh, cowling, or say the spinners, anything, that you mark it with some tape or something and index it. Say, this absolutely went this way. Because if you don't, what happens is, you know, the prop ends up going 180 out and the spinner's 180 out or back the way it was, and it's just, it's a mess. And so now you've induced this vibration and you have to try and figure out how to get it out and then the owner's mad at you or it's your plane, you're mad at you for making the whole plane shake. So um, sometimes... You know, if somebody brings a plane to me, it's like, you know, it's just, it really shakes a lot. I'll just put the prop on 180 and see how it works. You know, that's, so it's one cure. So vibration, oops. Oh, I'm sorry, this was troubleshooting. That was my whole thing. And then I had vibration. And I put rotating. Prop 180 degrees may help, may make it worse too. Also, when you rotate it 180 degrees, don't just walk up to the airplane and turn it 180 degrees. <laughs> I mean, you gotta take the prop off and put it on. Just making sure, because I know you guys are really cool. Um, I've heard of vibration because the torque was wrong, too loose, so re check torque. I, I know a really good, I know a decent mechanic who's spent a lot of time in the field and there is one particular uh, Herzl prop that is really, really difficult. It's the most difficult safety wire job in all of the general aviation. And you guys know that light combing that we really haven't looked, it's a four cylinder, but it's got a turbo hanging off the back, kind of by the tool room. The, okay, that's the prop, look at it. And it's hard for me to describe, but what they do is they use studs. Everybody knows what a stud is. It's a drilled stud. Everybody knows what a drilled stud is. They put a castellated nut on the drilled stud. This is how they put it together. They put the stud in, and they have a nut, and they turn it, and now it's inside of, and then they put a roll pin through it. So, and it's inside of kind of the prop. It's really hard to get to, and you're supposed to safety wire that with 040. I hear there's a service bolt that says you can use 32 on that one. I've never seen it, but... So it's really, really difficult. And sometimes those roll pins don't line up right and you're trying to force it around. So this guy tells me, oh, I got a simple solution to that. I'm like, oh, really, what is it? Oh, just torque the whole prop and then use Sharpie and then mark where everything should be. Untorque it, do the safety wire and then just bring it back where your Sharpie marks are. I'm like, dude, you're not serious, right? He's like, yeah. Okay, does torque work that way? Yes. No. <laughs> In his book. In his in book. His I mean, book. maybe it's right. I don't, you know, but that's not how we do stuff. You know, you don't untorque the safety wire. And then, so, yeah. Um, I'd rather have the safety wire look ugly. So, check torque. And then, wood props especially. Um, wood props. Wood props. Left with one blade down. Um, may retain moisture. What would you do? Throw the prop away. Dry. The I'd go the other way. Let the water drain. Hey, you know, just time it so it gets to the hub and comes out. Um, yeah. What else? Yeah. That's right, man. Yeah. Let it dry out. 
trying to think what else. Vibration. Yeah, it's about vibration. We're talking about fixed pitch props. There's not a whole lot on here. Um, now we'll go with repairs. All right. What kind of work can... Seriously, I'd rotate it the other way. Uh, like they yeah. left it with this blade down, I'd rotate it, put that blade up. Oh. Huh. And, uh, you know, let it warm up. Just keep going both ways. Um, <laughs> I would try that. Until, until, until I even it up. Yeah, then I'd say, hey, when, you know. You do. Yeah, they're both the one day. Yep. 20 degrees the other day. Yep. <laughs> um, the problem is because if you took it off and then tried to statically balance it, would you put it on a prop uh, stand? and you put it horizontal and you watch it, it'll kind of go this way. I used to have this class do this, but it's just an exercise and you putting weight on it till it works. I'm like, eh, busy work. And then the blade comes down, like, okay, that's the heavy blade. So you'd add a varnish or solder or, or steel wool or something if there's a spot for it until they balance perfectly. Or you can use washers on the hub, uh, prop bolts, which is of course way in here. It takes a lot of washers to affect that. So you got it perfect, right? And then what happens if that blade was retaining water and then it dried out? Yeah, it's oh, out now it's out of balance. So that's why I say I would try taking it the other way for a while first. And store it this way for a while. Um, okay, so 14 CFR 65. Those are our rules we follow. Does not allow, does not allow, allow an AMP or IA or IA to perform any major alterations or repairs to props. So IA, APs, IAs, we're not going to do it. Who can? Prop shops. Only prop shops. So, well, first of all, you know you can't. How do you know what is or is not a major alteration or repair? Something that requires you to take off the prop. That's a prop strike. Same thing. Your boss says you No. Do it. Prop strike inspection is a minor repair. So, how are you going to know? Appendix A. All right, FAR 43. Appendix A. Appendix A has a list. List of what? Major. List of major. <laughs> alterations and repairs. What? He's like, I got mine removed. Appendix. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so who can do major alterations or repairs? Only part 145, that's a certified repair station, certified for propellers. Only a part 145, I'll put prop shop. Just because you're a part 145, a repair station, like Mather is a repair station, but they don't think that includes instruments or props. So remember, repair stations are certified to do anything they're certified to do and nothing they're not. It's like, what? So like when you guys are A&Ps, we're all on the same page, right? We all have the same license certificate to do the same thing. The only difference will be if I or, or if you have had training or uh, Sherman, what are you working on? What did you work on today? Uh, uh, okay. So in a year and a half, he's going to have a A&P certificate and so will I, but I have an IA. He can work on a Piaggio. I can't. I've never worked on one, right? So, but if I get the training, sure, I can show me how, then I'm able to do it, right? So don't forget, that's how your A&P works. If you haven't had training, you're not supposed to do it, all right? So, but uh, a repair station can do anything that they are certified to do. Like my repair station, we could overhaul any engine up to, including 450 horsepower. If that had 451, we couldn't. Why? Because it's what our repair station said. Now, as an AMP, I could go well beyond that. I have no limitations as long as I've been trained to do it. Honor system, too. 
No limits. All right. Um, we wash props. Wash props with what? Fresh water. Fresh water and mild soap. Um, I have a after salt spray, but that's really, you know, mild soap. That's after exposure to salt water, um, routine maintenance, before inspections. Um, Maybe like lying over the bay, kind of? Like no. Yeah, like if you went to a, a yeah, you went to a, a runway by the ocean, Last left night. it overnight or something. I don't know. Yeah. We went to Anchorage. You're just stretching. No. Yeah. Uh, push your props. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they have exhaust right in front of it. Oh yeah. How are you going to clean that with mild soap? Better mild soap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the Q and A's. There was a question about that. Yeah. Uh, my first run through, I think so. Mark and Ron told me fresh water only. Mm -hmm. um, is the emphasis right here on on mild? I mean, like, because I are, are detergents bad for them? One of the problems with the well, Q and A's is they're not always right, yeah. and that's why you do the Q and A's because you need to learn them, but then you also need to learn what is right, and. So, okay, my own personal propeller. Yeah, I use purple power on it because I can get it at Walmart. Go Walmart. And <laughs> my favorite soap in the world is Ripper One from Hot Seat. That stuff is awesome. I, I mean, I just felt that. I used to wash airplanes. Okay. I used that for money on the side. Yeah. The hose would simple great. There was a service bulletin, I think, from Beechcraft. Really? Could be wrong on that. But I remember very clearly this information coming out. It said never ever use simple green on an aircraft because they found it was getting in between the, the sheets and causing it corrosion in between those sheets. So, I mean, it's common. I didn't have any people call. He just shook my hand and said, Watch my plane again, so I can't really. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. Not your problem. Aviation grade on like simple green makes. I know. Okay, well, then that was a long time ago. Maybe this is a new formula. I don't know. But yeah, I just use purple power and I get a bucket of purple power and I clean my whole belly and it gets the exhaust and oil and yeah, the bugs get all built up on the front of the prop and you got you want those off and so I just use a mild detergent and purple power. Uh, I can sleep tonight for business. Huh? I can sleep tonight for fun. He's probably, he's probably still flying around. Yeah, he's, he's probably fine. Probably not. Well, I'm probably <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I got to start. Okay. So uh, the, that Piaggio has uh, five blades on each uh, engine, and the exhaust was never clean. Like the exhaust, uh, uh, this turbo prop, right? Yes. Yeah. The exhaust on the propellers, the leftovers, whatever, was never cleaned ever. And so I've been scrubbing it with uh, purple powder to the point where the paint's coming off. But that's okay because the guy was going to repaint them anyway. But even the scrubbing and the purple powder and all the effort, it, that shit just doesn't work. Anymore. Dang. You can't spell Piaggio. Right? Yeah, the catfish. What? That thing is cool. That thing is funky looking. Is that it? What a hammerhead shark. Awesome. Yeah. When you fall behind on maintenance, it starts to pile up, doesn't it? It's like you gotta. Yeah. Um, it's thirsty. Not all airplanes are, yeah. <coughs> Minor surface damage, uh, repair. Oops, I'm going to write repair. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, repair with, with a fine cut file. Okay, now this information is out there for you guys going to the tool room and getting these bastard cut, single cut files. Oh, yeah. Take off like an inch for every, you're basically a, a rasp. It's a fine cut file. And you don't use square ones, you use rounded ones. So fine cut file, 
And now I know that some of the maintenance manuals are a little different. Even the AC has some different grits, but this is, I got out of this. And uh, double aught sandpaper. That may be a little soft, I would say. I like, you know, 400 grit, something like that. Um, often the leading edges need to be dressed out. Especially on a prop that lives in Lodi, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of loose gravel and rocks. You know, you, you, uh, you have to be real careful. Um, and by dressing the leading edge, what I mean is I will take a file, a fine cut file. Um, I'd use a flat one, but I use my jeweler's files. I don't get all crazy. I have a small one that's flat. And I will keep the contour and I'll go all the way down, keeping the contour. Take it because there's a lot of microscopic little uh, burrs and things and you can't really feel them, but it, it's a little bit of erosion until it's nice and smooth and polished. Then I'll go over it with sandpaper at like 400 grit till the whole prop is just the leading edge is nice and polished. And then I'll, um, you, you need to follow the manual on that. Usually they want you to put an alodyne coat on it and a specific uh, prop paint. Um, Tempo makes... Uh, epoxy paints for props. They're usually a pain in the butt, they don't work, but it's what you have to use. Um, let me see. C, A, B, C, D, E, F. I missed something, because F was minor surface damage. Oh, because I doubled up on E with her wash. A, B, C, D, E, F, which would be F. Um, no repairs, no re allowed allowed to um, sh shank of adjustable props. No repairs allowed to the shank of adjustable props. Um, cracks across the blade, transverse cracks. That's transverse, that's across the blade. I'm gonna run just a few minutes long here, but we'll finish this out. Let me see. G, H, um, prop bolt holes. A lot of stress around prop bolt holes. Um, believe it or not, they may be repaired. Seven yep, the torch. Uh, you'll never catch me doing this. I'd send it to a prop shop. I would consider that a major alteration. Uh, but according to AC 4313, it says they may be repaired um, by bushing holes. I'm pretty sure that's wood props only. I didn't write that, but I'm pretty confident. Um, let me see. Ha! Never mind. That's that's uh, I actually wrote it here. So bolt hole repair to wood not allowed. I'm sorry. I'm just having a hard time picturing. It fixing portals into any props, but I wrote it. Must be true. I told you guys about the mechanic who put the wrong crankshaft in an O235. There's because there's different flanges, so it's a 235 from the. Yeah, they're all 235, but there's the different versions. The what's the C version, C1 and C2, I think. Somebody was actually looked this up. Was you this did. The throw? No, it's not the throw. It's actually it's the size of the flange. Oh yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, you guys are doing that. And you actually mentioned it to me. The C1 versus the C2. I think you did, Vin, when you were looking for a bushing. I remember now. Okay, okay. Yep. so there, there's different ones, right? Well, the airframe is going to dictate which one because the airframe has a specific prop. So this guy calls, is like, hey, you know, I just the prop won't fit. 
I'm like, well, you got the wrong crankshaft. Well, it's a 235 crankshaft. Yeah, well, they make two different versions, and you can't convert that. The fix is you take the crank out and put the right one in. And, uh, and he goes, well, the, the prop won't fit. I'm like, no, I know the prop won't fit. It's the wrong crank. Well, so what, am I, what do I do? Do I just drill new holes in the, in the prop? I'm like, oh, God, no. And he's dead serious. And I heard a rumor that he actually did that. Very cool. drilled. Yeah, it's a rumor, but I heard that, that that he actually did. Somebody saw him. Hey, you know, I saw that guy. I mentioned it, and this, this particular mechanic, like, and somebody's like, "Dude, one day I saw him with a prop up on a drill press and was drilling holes." I'm like, oh, the story. The story came full circle. I'm like, I know why he was drilling holes in a prop. So. <laughs> You won't, especially if it's got a bulkhead and you don't take the spinner <laughs> off like it should. So um, if you shorten one blade, shorten the other. Obviously. So you had some damage to the or crack or something out on the, well, if I had a crack in my prop, I'd throw it away. Um, I wouldn't, but you can. You can cut off the tip. You can shorten them. Let me just shorten both sides. Um, use caution. What did you say? What? Okay. So use caution when you're refinishing uh, because you can cause an out of balance. So when you're finishing um, to prevent imbalance. You know, even with a spray can, you know, get a little carried away on one side. You know, <coughs> make sure you get carried away on the other side, so you got to keep them the same. And yeah. I have you guys do repairs on leading and trailing edges. You can actually do repairs right in the middle of the prop. I've done some. Like on the it's of it, yeah, right in the, like the face. I don't know why faces tend to get dings on them. The face. The it really does. Yeah, yeah. I did one not that long ago. And is it uh, back? How's it? Jedex doing it. I'm like, man, what are we gonna do? I'm like, well, just pull out the manual. Pull out the manual. Give me the data, and they bring me the data. I'm like, all right, this is what we gotta do. In repair. This, this is my width. This is that. So, you know, just have. The, I used a rubber abrasive disc, and you just make all your marks. Know what you're gonna do. Measure it out. Go in there. Polish it till it's done. Aladine it. Paint it. Call it a day. No, not a big deal. All right. <clears throat>